Aloha, everyone, and welcome to our second day of our 2024 OOP series in online language pedagogy, focusing on the language Russian. We thank you all so much for joining us. We're very glad to have you all here. And hello to everyone in the archive as well. I have a few quick housekeeping things to go over before we get started. I do want to quickly put into the chat for hopefully you can bookmark this, uh, the link to our OLP website. And I'll go ahead and put that into the chat if you would like to bookmark that. And NFLRC offers so many fantastic programs now and throughout the year and in previous years. And all of that information is available to our world language educators. So please feel free to bookmark that and check out those resources. I'm certain you'll be able to find all kinds of good things there. And then I will also put a link to the chat to our webpage for this series. It was recently updated. And what I really wanted to call your attention to was the fact that we've got all the resources that were shared by both the panelist and the audience participants. Now, granted, NFLRC is not vetting anything, uh, so we certainly can't guarantee anything will or will not work for you, but they're just resources that are available. In fact, just to go out and take you there, I'll screen share very quickly. Uh, but we've got a lot of those good resources for you, so please feel free to check those out. And I hope that you will be able to find things that will work for you. And just as a friendly reminder, uh, we will have our third and final webinar as part of the series coming up in uh, 48 hours from now. I know people are joining from all over the world, but that will be our third and final session. So we do hope to see you there. And once again, we do have all of those resources for you, and you can go back and explore those at any time, as there are a lot of things that were shared on the, the conference at Monday. And we also have the digital badge, if you are interested in earning the digital badge for this webinar series. All of the details are here on the webpage. And we also have the link to the exit survey. Once you've completed the exit survey, you would be linked to the spot would submit your content for the digital badge. And so we wanted to make sure everybody had those materials. But I'm gonna go ahead and stop screen sharing now and I want to get into our panel discussion. And today we have two panelists. So we have Shannon Donnelly Quinn and Heather Rice that are joining us. And much like on Monday, I was hoping we could just have our panelists briefly introduce themselves, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are, your background, to share a little bit about your background with all of our audience. So uh, Shannon, if you don't mind introducing yourself, please. Sure, I'm Shannon Quinn. I'm um, Associate Professor of Russian at Michigan State University. Uh, I went to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin. My dissertation was in literature, like I said on Monday, science fiction. So that's a, a fun topic that I still teach from time to time, but I focus more on language teaching and technology now. After finishing uh, my uh, PhD, I, um, as I was uh, in my first job, I went back and took uh, courses and eventually got a, a master's degree in instructional design. So that's been really helpful as well. Um, I've taught at the Middlebury School of Russian. And um, I also am really active with the International Association for Language Learning Technology. I manage their webinars. And so we do webinars once a month. And I'm the uh, also the editor of their online journal, which is called the FLT Mag. You can find it at fltmag.com. And it's a free online journal uh, about uh, in implementing technology and language learning and teaching. And so it's a great resource um, that I definitely wanted to mention um, for everyone to subscribe to. So those are some of the things I do and I'm sure I'll talk more about some other projects today. Fantastic, thank you for sharing that with us, Shannon. And Heather, if you could please introduce yourself. Uh, hello everybody, um, my name is Heather Rice. I am an associate professor of instruction at the University of Texas at Austin. I teach um, beginner level Russian, so first and second year Russian. And I did my graduate work at Indiana University. Um, I see a lot of my colleagues and um, former uh, grad student classmates um, in the audience. It's good to see everybody. Uh, I focus not on literature, so... Um, I actually feel a little shy whenever uh, literature is mentioned um, because that's that's definitely not my uh, strong suit. Um, I did linguistics. 
So in my classes, I talk a lot about um, the linguistics, Slavic linguistics in particular. Uh, my dissertation focused on the acquisition of the palatalization contrast that exists in Russian because I found it personally so difficult. Um, so I do a lot of talk about like phonetics and phonology in my class and really work on accent. Um, and uh, most recently, well, I guess um, the reason that, that I'm here and, and thank you for inviting me is that um, in 2016, I was invited by UT to create a, an online Russian class, like exclusively online. This was before the pandemic. Um, we wanted to offer this to both our UT students and to extension students. So what we got to do was develop um, like a fully in-house um, language course, Russian introductory Russian language course uh, using this like uh, really advanced kind of video technology at the time um, housed at UT. And so I've been working on that since 2017. And I was saying a little bit earlier um, when I came in here that I'm kind of set in my ways. And I was actually really thankful to um, the panelists on Monday for mentioning a lot of uh, newer resources that I, I plan to check out. Um, so we developed this uh, online course and most recently we were um, awarded an IRS grant, an International Research and Studies Grant by the Department of Education to transform this online course into an OER that will be available in a couple of years. So we're, we're working on that right now, um, but it's, it's for like first and second year Russian. So that's me. Excellent. Well, we love a good OER. So thank you for your help with that, Heather. Much appreciated. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into our questions for the day. And I'm going to start with the first one, really getting down to basics. And as somebody who is a Japanese teacher, I am fascinated by uh, Russian Cyrillic and how all that works. So I would love to know how you start teaching, reading, and writing in Russian in general. So things like the Cyrillic alphabet, sound systems, and characters. Shannon, I would love to hear what you think about all this. Sure, and it was really interesting that on Monday, even though that wasn't the focus of our uh, panel, there was a lot of discussion about these things in the chat. Um, and so it's obviously something that's on a lot of people's minds and everybody has a different um, opinion about some of these things. And I think um, there are many different ways to approach it, but I can just describe what I do in my classes in, in the beginning um, when we're learning uh, the alphabet, handwriting, typing, et cetera. And I think I'm kind of collapsing your first couple questions together into one, but um, uh, we'll just uh, go with it. So um, I do teach the uh, alphabet really early. Um, I start working with them in the alphabet in the first week or two, even week uh, of class. And the reason I do that is because I feel that a lot of people like having that visual support uh, to what they're learning when they're speaking. Obviously, there's a lot of value in um, having them just listen and, and learn learn some things right at first, even without the alphabet, like greetings, etc. But I do start really early. And um, in general, my class follows a kind of flipped classroom model, and I teach um, I teach uh, online, but I also teach uh, hybrid and in-person courses as well. And so, when I'm talking about these things, all of those are sort of in my mind, not not limited to online. But it's kind of a flipped classroom model where my students do activities before class so that they're prepared for what we're gonna do in class. And uh, so to that end, I have a set of lessons that I developed that my students use. And I developed them in part uh, in cooperation with some other people at the Middlebury School of Russian. And so you can find these lessons on the Middlebury School of Russian's pre-immersion site. If you're familiar with Middlebury, you know that they have a language pledge. And so once, people get to campus, they're not supposed to speak languages other than than Russian. And so you can imagine how difficult that is for level one students who have no background. And so a few years ago, I forget how long it was, more than five years, though, I think maybe six or seven years ago, we developed what we call the pre-immersion site. And that helps students get ready to come to campus. And it was for all students for the Middlebury School of Russian, but 
In particular, we had a section that was for students who were going to be joining level one. And so we developed, and um, some of the people who were involved in that were Jason Merrill, Yevgeny Dingub, Susanna Nazarova. Um, and uh, so we have a set of four lessons that you can find on that site. The first three of them introduce uh, the letter and things like cognates and pictures, visuals, et cetera. Um, and then similar to some other alphabet learning lessons you, you might uh, see around, but you're welcome to use them if you're interested in them. But I wanted to in particular mention the fourth lesson. Uh, I'm really proud of the fourth lesson. It, it actually won uh, an award from uh, the H5P, they were called the H5P Academy Awards. <laughs> so um, it won an award uh, for interactive sort of uh, instructional technology. Um, and what the fourth lesson does is it it's called a day in St. Petersburg. And it takes what students have learned for their new reading skills of uh, knowing the alphabet and imagines if they were in St. Petersburg for a day and what they would do with those reading skills. So we pretend that they go on the metro and have to read a sign. We pretend that they uh, go to a bookstore and have to find the section of the bookstore that they want to go to. We pretend that they get hungry for lunch and go to a, a restaurant and have to uh, choose a restaurant. Um, and we pretend that they buy a ticket to a theater performance. And so the idea hopefully is that they can then imagine themselves actually using these new skills. So those four lessons are what I start with to teach them the Cyrillic alphabet. And I find that, um, you know, they, and I'm pretty sure that most of the, my other colleagues see this as well, that, you know, it takes a while for them to get confident with it, for, but for them to get started, it's pretty quick. Um, we do it over a week or two, and then they just continue to uh, solidify their their skills. Um, I guess I can come back to handwriting and typing uh, at a, for a later question and, and hand it off to Heather to tell about her experience. Oh, absolutely. And we will definitely talk quite a bit, I'm sure, about handwriting and typing. It's quite a hot topic. Heather, would love to get your input on, again, same question. So how do you start reading and writing in Russian in general, teaching the Cyrillic alphabet, sound systems, characters, things like that? Um, well, I, I actually stole an idea from a book when I was um, teaching high school Russian. I think I was using, I think it was beginner's Russian and their approach is the one that I adopted. And that was kind of chunking the alphabet into um, three different parts. And so what, what I do now is I teach the alphabet in three distinct different lessons. I take 10 um, characters for the first couple of days. And these are the most recognizable characters, the ones that are most similar to the English, most uh, like, equivalent to English letters. And I teach them the the letter, the, what the letter is called in Russian and the sound that it makes and um, how it's written in block letters. And of course, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and then I get them to start from day one, actually reading, combining these 10 letters into cognates. So I did, a, like, I, I sat down and I really just kind of brainstormed for a couple of hours what are the cognates that I can make from these 10 letters? And there, there are quite a few. Um, and so we start just taking it bit by bit. Um, so just with those 10 letters. And I include um, a couple of words that aren't cognates so that they can immediately start making questions and answers. And they include kuto, shto, and eta. And that's who, what, and this is. Um, and then the other um, letters combine to make either people's names or just common uh, nouns that they will recognize. So there are three new Russian words with these first 10 letters and then um, cognates that as soon as they say them, they'll know what they are. And then we proceed like after we do that, we take another 11 letters and then another, I think the last 12 letters. Um, the second set of letters are um, 
They look like they would be familiar for the most part, but they aren't. So this would be letters like the Russian N, which looks like the English H, or the Russian R, which looks like the English P. And then the last set of letters is the most um, foreign looking. So they may be letters like Z, um, the one that looks like the Kim Kardashian perfume sign <laughs> is what a high school student told me. So that's how that's how I approach it. And it takes about a week. I love that analogy. And that's quite interesting. One of your students came up with that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's, yeah, so I, I like the idea of chunking it down and especially pulling those cognates in. It's a great way to get the students involved on day one. So fantastic idea. Um, whenever you teach the Cyrillic alphabet in the online environment, is there anything special you need to do for online versus if you were face-to-face -face or even hybrid? How do you tackle the online elements? Is this to me? Uh, yes, Heather, go ahead, please. Um, so first, um, so first I want to say like starting out, like designing this online course, you know, I had the privilege of being able to design this course thinking, what is this experience going to be like for the end user online? You know, I didn't start designing this, um, from, from the classroom perspective. It started like thinking about like, how is this going to be delivered and perceived online? And knowing that with Russian, you know, when they're starting out, they're dealing with a completely new alphabet. Um, so, so what do I do? First, the idea of writing and any sort of input on the student side is kind of put aside for a couple of weeks. And it's all just, um, it's all just passive uh, learning or receptive learning. So I don't know that this differs that much, um, like in the online environment versus like in person. Uh, but I just focus on visuals, you know, giving them uh, usually videos or Quizlet or some kind of online flashcards that show them, you know, the characters and getting them to just recognize them visually. And um, I usually give a lot of Quizlets or Canvas quizzes um, where they can identify, you know, a letter by its sound or by its English equivalent. Um, yeah, I don't know that there's anything in particular about the online mode uh, that you need to take into consideration when when teaching the alphabet. No, hurt. thank you for that. And I, I can see how, yes, just the need of the repetition and the practice oh. is really critical at that stage. Thank you for sharing that. And then Shannon, same question to you. Whenever you teach students the Cyrillic alphabet, especially in the online environment, is there anything special you need to do there to help them be successful? I would agree with Heather that it's not that different for me uh, from a face-to-face -face class. Uh, and especially because my face-to-face -face class have become so technology enhanced anyway, they're really more like hybrid courses. And so my students use a lot of online uh, resources and tools uh, in the, even in a class that's technically considered face-to-face. -face. But one thing that came to my mind is that, um, and this kind of starts to get to the topic of handwriting, which is that um, one thing that I think actually works really well in the online environment are tools like Zoom's annotation tools. I really love using those and I think students have fun with them too. And um, having a, when I uh, was teaching online, um, I started using an iPad uh, and just a kind of cheap, uh, not, a, not a fancy Apple pencil or anything, but just kind of a cheap one, stylus that would go with my iPad. And then if you show slides on Zoom, then you can turn on the annotation tools and you can write on the slide. And I, I found that a really useful tool for many things, but also including um, handwriting. And um, actually, I ended up then taking that to my 
face-to-face -face classes. I started um, after uh, when I wasn't teaching, uh, there was a while that I wasn't teaching fully online classes. Um, even though I wasn't teaching fully online classes for a while there, I was in my face-to-face -face class, I would connect to Zoom in my classroom with no one else except me, <laughs> but I would use my iPad to then annotate on the slides. And so that has been a tool that I have found really useful. Surprisingly, with my students in the live sessions, they actually love drawing characters using the stylus or using their trackpad, and it does help them retain. So I, I like that we're taking the tools that are a little bit more tech, and we're also applying them. For those of you who are teaching face-to-face -face or hybrid, we're taking that technology and bringing it into all the classrooms. I love that. Thank you for that. Um, actually, this might be a good segue into my next question since we're talking a little bit about um, handwriting and versus typing. Ed, Shannon, just to start with you, how much handwriting do you teach and use in the online classroom? I still do teach my students handwriting, and it was really interesting the other day looking at the different people's uh, opinions about, you know, how much handwriting we should do. And I can just, I, I don't think anyone is wrong or right, but I can just tell you what I do in my class, which is that I do still teach them handwriting. I think it's still important, especially for them to be able to read uh, handwriting. Um, and so I still teach it and I teach, teach it quite early. Similar to what I was describing with the alphabet, I also have uh, an online activity that my students do to learn to handwrite the uh, alphabet. And it's also available. Um, so the alphabet lessons, I mentioned the pre-immersion site, but there's also another place where those are available. And there are a lot more things available, um, which is a website called LLC Commons. And that's a website that was supported by uh, Circle from the University of Arizona. And Ludmila Klimanova and I uh, put together this website. And it's uh, it's got a whole bunch of activities. Some are mine and some are uh, hers and some of her students. Um, a lot of activities that are available for anyone to use in kind of a flipped classroom uh, sort of situation. And the handwriting lesson is available in there as well. And so you're welcome to assign it to your students to sort of give them their first uh, try or first pass at learning the, uh, the handwriting. Um, so I do teach them handwriting and I do require it for a, for a little while. Um, and I can describe that. So in the, in, in my class, uh, and I'm similar to Heather in that I mostly teach first and second year uh, Russian. In my first year class, uh, we use the textbook Mieszdunami, which I think a lot of people are familiar with. And you can find it at mieszdunami.org. I think I forgot to put it in my resource list just because I thought probably most people already know it. But um, I can type it in in a second. Um, it's a free online um, a textbook that was written by Linda Benedette. Bill Comer and Alice Muslova. So it's really great. We we use that um, in our first three semesters. Um, and that uh, textbook is divided into nine chapters and we do three chapters per semester for three semesters. So um, each semester is sort of divided into three. So I require uh, that students actually hand write like in cursive for about the first chapter. And then at chapters two and further after that, then it's sort of their choice. I do still have assignments that I assign that they I ask them to write with their hand. And if they choose to write in sort of what we might call print, then that's their choice at that point. But I do, uh, you know, try to talk to them about the fact that it's not usual for people who grow up uh, speaking Russian to write in print, that it's pretty much the uh, people, native speakers of Russian learn cursive right away. And so print is something that's sort of a, a unique maybe to our students. And I, I, I want them to know that so that they can make the choice on their own, whether they want to be try to conform to the native speaker uh, pattern or whether they whether they're choosing to be different, I guess. Um, and so I do require that they learn the 
cursive handwriting for the first part of the first semester. But then at some point, I say it's your choice after this. I do give them some assignments that it, where I require them to use their hands and write. Um, and, you know, it's a little awkward in the online classroom when it's a face-to-face -face or hybrid class. I have them write it on paper and give it to me. Um, in the online classroom, it's a little bit more awkward. And so usually if they have a tablet, they'll do it in a tablet app. If they don't, then they're welcome to take a picture of it and send it through our course management system. And I give feedback on it that way. It's it's a little harder to do than on paper, but it's still possible. Um, so, so like I say, I do require them to do handwriting for a little bit. After that, I still want them to write using their hands. And um, as I have decided, Kind of which activities I want them to do in typing and which I want to do handwritten. I think about, for example, that for many people, uh, using handwriting helps you to remember things better. Maybe not everyone is that way, but um, there's some indication that that may be true for many people. And so, for example, if an activity has, say, new vocabulary that they haven't used before, then I might choose that one to have uh, to require them to actually handwrite. Whereas uh, with typing, I do have them learn to type uh, within the first semester. I think it's in chapter two, uh, so sort of the second third of that first semester. Um, and I agree with many of my colleagues who have said that I do feel that typing is more important than handwriting now and probably getting more and more important as time goes on, but I still think it's important for them to be able to read handwriting and at least have the choice of whether they want to learn uh, and use handwriting or not. Excellent, and that was something I thought about too uh, during yesterday's discussion when there was a lot of talk of not teaching handwriting. I personally am a very kinesthetic learner and I learned to write characters by rep repetition of physical writing. And I was wondering how that might impact students. But thank you for that. Really appreciate those insights. Uh, Heather, same question to you now talking about uh, handwriting. How much handwriting do you teach and use in your online classroom? Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a question that, um, you know, I dealt with from, from very, very early on. And in short, I don't teach handwriting. Um, I definitely was taught it. And when I went into development of this online course, I was definitely of the mind that, yes, I mean, they have to know Russian cursive. It's important, you know. Um, it just was such an integral part of my own education that I thought I, I definitely have to include this. And, you know, and when I did teach in person before developing the online class, it was it was something everybody learned. But because like as Shannon said, in the online class, when it's strictly online, and this really was before um, tablets with the stylus were so, such in, in common use as they are now, um, it was so clunky and so difficult to convey uh, the lesson teaching, you know, this handwriting and to receive and then to um, mark it up. So at some point really early on, I decided, you know, maybe at least in the first year, this isn't necessary for an online student because given our, you know, our world today, most people communicate, like as we've all said, right? We mostly communicate by text and by email. And the most important thing, you know, regarding communication really is uh, keyboard input. So this is going to be the way that I teach. I'm going to just teach keyboard input. Um, part of that decision was based on our, our classes are actually semi-intensive and taking the time to teach handwriting when it, it couldn't be something that we could use for all of our lessons was going to be a, just an, an actual, a drag on, on the classes themselves. This is not me making any sort of statement that, you know, handwriting isn't important. Like you said, um, Sarah, I'm, I'm also a kinesthetic learner. When I make notes to myself, they're never digital. I all, I still write and I write in Russian cursive. Um, so it was kind of a hard decision for me to, to make this, to, to, to decide not to teach everybody in my classes handwriting. That said, 
I did create videos um, and include them in an optional module for students, like teaching them handwriting and how, like how each of the letters is formed in cursive and how they connect and with optional lessons. So if a student does wish to do them, they can. Um, and I and I tell all the students this at the beginning of my classes. Um, and of course, you know, it, handwriting is especially useful for anyone, um, especially anyone studying abroad, uh, even in countries um, outside of Russia and Ukraine itself. Um, you know, they will encounter Russian script for graduate students of history, you know, doing archival research. It's incredibly important to know how to read at the very least. Um, so I don't teach it. Um, I focus on the keyboard and keyboard input, um, but I do offer it optionally because I, I also, I agree with Shannon. I, I would like for students to have that choice. Um, and like I said, I, I do it myself. Um, but given this state of the world right now and our communication mostly being you know text and email keyboard seems the most pressing and when i <laughs> when i when i even when i teach my in person classes i don't teach cursive and i write in block letters on the board which is a little odd which is a little strange and like shannon said it's it's not um it's not the norm but it's uh, it's what we do. Very interesting. I definitely see a lot of pros and cons on both sides, and there's just so many things to consider, especially because with especially writing curriculum, we're often so limited. We only have so much time with our students, so it's it's definitely an interesting topic. And I like that we were able to hear from educator Shannon, who does teach, and then Heather. It's an optional thing. It's available, but it's not mandatory. Very interesting. Thank you for some great discussion on that. Um, and that might be a good segue into the next question, talking a little bit about typing. So what are some of the challenges that students are facing whenever they're learning to type the Cyrillic alphabet? And Heather, since you were just talking about that, we'll start with you, please. Um, so typing in Russian, I mean, obviously, right, we've got a, a different alphabet they're dealing with. Um, what I do is provide students with um, resources on how to install or you know download a Russian language keyboard. And there are, of course, options. You can uh, you can use the traditional Cyrillic layout, Russian Cyrillic layout, or you can use a phonetic Russian phonetic keyboard, which is what I use. Um, and it, as most everyone here knows, right? It aligns with the English characters. So the way a Russian letter sounds will align with the English character. So like Russian P will be where English P is on the keyboard. So if you know how to type in English, it's almost intuitive. And this is the one that I encourage my students to download. But what I find every semester is that nearly half of the students choose to um uh, install the traditional Cyrillic keyboard and usually order um, Cyrillic stickers to to put on their keyboard um, to learn the traditional layout. They're, they're more comfortable just starting from scratch. Um, and like I was saying, as far as, uh, you know, recognizing Cyrillic letters, we really focus on that first kind of this receptive or, or passive knowledge at first learning to identify what the letters the sounds the letters make. We do that for a couple of weeks before I start requiring any sort of input on uh, the student's part um, using the keyboard to give them time to, to install or to download and then to kind of practice. Um, it's, it's tough. Um, one of the, I guess the biggest challenges I run into, especially in the first year and the first semester Russian, is that a lot of students will, instead of learning the keyboard, instead of um, getting into it, is they will copy and paste um, from text that I've included in, in quizzes and uh, in lessons for their answers, they will just copy and, and paste. And so to, to get them to not do that, 
um, well, and I would do this anyway, really, is I include stress marks because stress is, is very important in Russian. I include stress marks on all of the Russian words and in all of the texts that the students see. Um, and when they copy and paste, especially into our LMS, into Canvas, um, it will include a stress mark and Canvas won't recognize the stress mark and we'll, we'll kick it out and count it wrong. Um, so this is kind of one sort of like built in way I've, I've got to deter students from copying and pasting um, and, and actually learning to type. Um, but that's one of the biggest challenges is just to keep them from doing that. Definitely. And I can see where you would run into that quite a lot, especially for those first semester students that might be struggling enough with the language in general. And then there's that extra layer of typing. But I like how we're kind of using Canvas features to our advantage and really encouraging them to jump in and use the keyboard. Thank you. Uh, Shannon, same question, uh, talking about uh, typing and uh, telling us a little bit about how uh, you teach typing and what kinds of things are students maybe going to struggle with if they are using a Cyrillic keyboard. Yeah, I'll just echo oh, some of the things that Heather was saying about um, the choice between the standard layout and the phonetic layout uh, of the keyboards. And it's kind of an interesting thing because um, my own experience is that when I started learning to type in Russian, you had to get a whole bunch of special fonts and things on your computer. <laughs> and so um, I learned on the phonetic keyboard and I still, still type using the phonetic keyboard. But the interesting thing is I really regret that. And I wish I typed using the standard layout. And you should, you could, you should say to me, I should learn it and I should, but now that I have uh, the other habit, it's really hard for me to, uh, to switch to a different, um, keyboard layout. So I use the phonetic, personally use the phonetic layout, but in, in many instances, I have regretted that because if I were on a computer that wasn't mine, uh, in the past, it would be that the standard layout would be the one that you would be able to get to. Uh, or um, even now on my phone, the layout that uh, comes with uh, my phone is the standard layout. And so I'm really, really slow at texting in Russian because I'm not that well familiar with the standard layout. So um, because of my own experience, up until maybe recently, uh, and maybe even now, I maybe I haven't decided for this year yet, but um, I have always required my students to learn the standard layout. And um, I gave them a website, which I forget if I included in my, in my resource list, I will um, put it in the chat if I didn't, but um, I used a, a typing lesson website that's called sense lang. It's like sense lang.org slash typing. Oh, thank you. I did. <laughs> um, so Jim put it in the chat. Thank you very much. There are other ones out there as well, but that's the one that I've been using for a long time. And it has 16, I think it's 16 lessons. And you learn basically two letters at a time. So first you learn these two, and then you learn these two, and then you add these. Um, and so I try to make the argument to my students that, you know, uh, the standard layout uh, is more accessible in many ways. And that if you have it on your phone, that that's going to be the layout that's probably going to pop up. And also the standard layout, I think, can be faster if you get really good at it because it's not built like QWERTY, which was on purpose to slow people down. Um, it has the most common letters right here, O and A. Um, I'm starting to rethink that, however, because uh, it is true now that, number one, you can get phonetic uh, keyboards pretty easily. It used to be a lot harder to get phonetic keyboards, and it would be the standard one that you could get easily. Um, so that has changed. And the other thing that has changed is that I think it's a lot more rare for people to use other people's devices at this point. So where it used to be that like when I would be in Russia, I would be using like a, an internet cafe computer, right? And then that would make it very difficult for me to type. Um, that is changing. And so it may be that it's time for me to think about whether I don't require anymore the standard layout, but you know, still sort of make the argument to my students about why I wish I had learned the standard layout and then 
let them choose on their own and still sort of thinking, thinking about that. But that uh, standard layout is what I used to always teach them. And I used that website called SenseLang.org. Like I said, I start teaching them typing pretty early. It's like in chapter two of our textbook, which is in sort of the second third of our first semester. Similar to Heather, in the very beginning of the semester, we have a lot of sort of drag and drop things where students can do it without typing at first, uh, as they're still learning uh, the letters, uh, etc. But I do start having them type pretty quickly. And I try to, I, I have encountered some of what Heather's talking about with co copying and pasting. Um, and that's an interesting, uh, an interesting deterrent uh, idea for deterrent, uh, Heather. Um, but, you know, I try to make the argument to them that, you know, you're really going to need to to do this. Um, it's going to be, you know, included in your tests. Um, and so, you know, avoiding it now is just going to make it harder later. So, and I think many of them um, see the value in being able to type because that sort of opens up a whole new world for you in accessing the Russian internet, et cetera. Yeah, there's actually there's a great comment in the chat from Natalia uh, talking about how she learned to type English first and then learned how to type in Russian. But it was a frustrating experience. And it sounds like and correct me if I'm wrong, Natalia, but it, it's I remember learning to type as a child and it was something I struggled a lot with. And it's really important to kind of let students know this is the argument for using this keyboard layout versus the other and and kind of making an informed choice and also just maybe based on what they're best able to do if you're like me and you kind of have the struggle of, of typing and learning something might be harder than absolutely we kind of need to let the students choose i think so lots of things to think about on that topic too thank you both very much I want to shift the conversation a little bit and talk a little bit more about scaffolding and especially that uh, Russian is not a language that uses the Roman alphabet. We might often need to resort to scaffolding to make especially those authentic materials something that our students can really use and, and sink their teeth into. So to start off, uh, Shannon, we'll start with you. How do you work with scaffolding whenever you are um, teaching students reading and writing? What kinds of things do you do with scaffolding? Well, similar to what I said on Monday, this is an area where I think online materials really, really are um, so helpful because there are so many ways to embed uh, support uh, for whatever whatever support is potentially needed, but with without kind of inconveniencing everyone who may not need that. And so, um, one of my favorite tools that I use for so many things um, is called H5P. You can find it in a variety of places. Um, you can find it at h5p.org or h5p.com. There's also a really great website called Anvil, which is anvil, A-N-V-I-L-L dot U, Oregon dot edu, where you can access H5P for free. Um, it's one of my favorite tools for a lot of reasons, but one of the uh, reasons for that is because it allows so many different ways to embed different types of support and scaffolding and help. Um, so I've used it in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, I can give a couple of examples. Um, one is that, uh, uh, for example, when my students um, very, very early in semester one, when my students are still learning the alphabet, um, they, I use uh, one of the episodes of Masha y Medved, uh, Masha and the Bear, which you're probably familiar with. Um, where it's the episode where she goes to school, and um, if you watch the video, then you know you may notice that at the very beginning of the video, the bear is is uh, watching the news, and you can overhear the news as you start watching the video. And in the news, if you're paying attention to it and understand it. It's telling you that it's the 1st of September, which of course uh, tells us that it's the first day of school. Um, and so that sort of, that context prepares you for what's coming next. And uh, the H5P interactive video tool allows you to have 
um, support like that just pop up on the screen without kind of interrupting the flow of what you're watching. So that if you're a, a you know level one Russian student and you don't know that and you can't understand what they're saying on the news, you can still get that support that you need. Um, another example that's kind of on a higher level is um, I want to give example an example from another project that I've been working on, which is called the Rails Project, um, Russian Advanced Interactive Listening Series. Um, this was a series that was um, it was uh, led by Benjamin Rifkin back in the early two thousands, and it it's uh, for uh, um, more advanced uh, learners of Russian, probably intermediate, high, or so, maybe even advanced. Um, and it uses documentary films and interviews with experts, Russian experts uh, on a variety of topics. And uh, the way that I use, I use the same tool that's called the H5P interactive video. I use that same tool for this uh, project. And what we do is we have a video, it's divided into clips, and then there are, for each clip, there are a set of buttons that appear on the left side of the screen. And there's a whole bunch of different types of help, like it has guided questions, keywords, it has a glossary, it has um, what we call periscas, which is like kind of a summary of the clip, but in simpler language. Um, it also has uh, cultural notes, grammatical notes, and it has a uh, transcript and translation. And so all of these buttons show up on the left so that a person who is listening to it can then uh, click those in order to get help when they need it. But if a person is maybe a higher level and they don't need it, they can just go through and watch the video without using the help. And so I think our online tools are so adept at offering us ways to give support. And I know I was talking about listening rather than reading, but there are very similar uh, similar things available for, for reading as well. And so I think um, some of these tools are very equipped to give us good, really great ways to support students. Another thing I really like about this same tool, H5P, is that it gives a lot of ways to provide targeted feedback. So I think a lot of us as Russian teachers, uh, we are pretty, we're pretty good at guessing uh, what is gonna be difficult for our students and or we have experience that tells us what's gonna be difficult. And so if we have a question, for example, in one of these activities, and we give a distractor that we know is gonna be pretty tempting for students for one reason or another, then uh, H5P gives a lot of opportunities for us to give feedback for every possible answer. It's not only like good job or, or not correct, it's also if you choose this particular answer, I can give you feedback to help you understand why your answer was incorrect, for example. Um, and so that's another reason why I really like this tool. It also has uh, the capability so this offers us ways to differentiate in a way. And it, it also gives us the capability to have at least a little bit of rudimentary adaptivity in that, for example, you can have students in your interactive video, you can have students um, do an activity. And if they get everything correct, they can skip to a different part in the video so that if someone needs more help, then they can keep going. But if they already have mastered that uh, particular thing, then they can skip over it. So it allows us the uh, ability to somewhat differentiate and give a little bit of adaptivity to our, our online materials. Yeah, it almost sounds like a little bit of a different differentiation to your own adventure there, really letting the students pick what do you need help with and then being able to provide that. So I just I love hearing about this. Thank you. Yeah. And you I, can I, also yeah, do yeah. something. You can also do something like a choose your own adventure. That's another way that you can use that same tool. I love it. Thank you. Excellent. And then Heather, same question, talking about scaffolding. How do you work with scaffolding whenever you're teaching students things like reading and writing? Um, so my response to this, um, and I think this is a really, really good question. Um, 
I haven't used H5P in my classes. I'm, I'm familiar with it um, and I've seen it and I think it's a really great tool. Um, we, all of our classes um, are built directly into Canvas, the Canvas LMS, and a lot of the same tools are available. So Shannon was just mentioning um, this, this feedback feature. Uh, Canvas also provides, which I really like to use, you know, so if a student does get something wrong, I'm able to like for each each answer, whether it's it's correct or incorrect, give them some sort of feedback. I um, just wanted to make a statement about uh, that. Um, but as far as regards reading and scaffolding, um, what I really like to do, especially in the lower level classes, is to you know, one, I want to keep things real. I want to use um, authentic materials and authentic texts right away for students, but I want to um, combine it with uh, the familiar, you know? So I, I rely on a lot of um, familiar, familiarity for uh, scaffolding. So we're online. I make use of a lot of websites. Um, one thing, and this and this is usually really early on. Uh, so McDonald's is no longer in existence in Russia, but it's been um, uh, transformed into another restaurant called uh, Um, And I think that's the name of it. Uh, so I might take my students to a website like this. Um, and just the layout itself, is familiar. Students know just by the, they've seen sites like this in English. They understand, you know, based on pictures, what they're looking at. Um, so I rely on the familiar to kind of um, boost students uh, into being able to read in Russian. So we might explore uh, a site like Gusnitochka um, for a while. I, I, I can't show this site right now, but um, across the top, you know, there's a menu and one of the um, categories, one of the menus is, uh, one of the categories on the menu is novinka. And I direct my students' attention to this word novinka. And I say, let's, let's look at this word. What What is familiar in this particular word? You know, and the students actually have to have some degree of Russian at this point. And they're able to say, Novoy, you know, this this has something to do with something new, like new items. Um, there are a lot of cognates on these sites. Uh, so I think, yeah, in short, I rely on like really mining and using a familiar layout. Social media is another. Um, I direct my students to, um, I can no longer require students use social media like I used to be able to do 15 years ago. Um, now we just can explore it, but I can point my students to Vkontaktia, the uh, Russian kind of equivalent of Facebook. And just looking at the homepage, it's it's a very familiar layout. And I'm sure a lot of um, teachers here are, you know, are, would agree and maybe even use this. You know, the familiar um, layout to the students, they they already know what something is just by the layout itself. Um, just by the icons that are, you know, used both in uh, the English language version and the, the Russian language version of these sites. Like, for example, the search bar, I can ask them, so how, where would you go to search? Well, they know by looking at the website and seeing the um, the magnifying glass that that word, their voice must mean search or you know, I can I can ask them, well, where do you think, you know, login is or password? And so just undergirding everything with the familiar, um, but with authentic materials uh, is especially um, a powerful tool for uh, for reading at first um, and for, for scaffolding. Excellent. I like the idea of bringing in things that are familiar, even the layouts and the formats, just to kind of put students at ease and they might be a little, little bit more willing to really dig in and, mm -hmm. and look at some of these vocabulary words and make some connections in their own way. Excellent. Thank you. And staying on the topic of scaffolding, um, where do you think students are more likely to need scaffolding 
whenever, especially you're thinking about Russian and the online environment. And Heather, since we were talking about layouts, where do you think they really need that scaffolding? I mean, definitely when they're encountering any sort of text um, and, and, you know, and, and of course audio too, but um, uh, everywhere for my first year, for my first year students everywhere, every time they encounter Russian um, text and audio. Definitely. And yes, seeing that um, Russian does not use the Roman alphabet, it's just so important to have that scaffolding because otherwise, you, I, as a teacher of Japanese, I dread those blank stares when you pull up a website, for example, and students just aren't making any connections. So definitely important to put that in a lot of places. Uh, mm -hmm. Shannon, same question. Whenever you are uh, working with students, where do you think students are going to be more likely to need that scaffolding in the online classroom? I mean, I agree with Heather that it's everywhere and it's um, there aren't a lot of shortcuts, but um, uh, maybe I can I can um, answer this by describing um, one set of lessons that I've developed. I'm um, I teach, as I mentioned before, I teach first year and second year, but second year is kind of my domain. I'm always the one teaching second year and I sort of sometimes teach first year. But so as I uh, told you before, uh, we use the textbook Mies Dunami for the first three semesters. And then that leaves me the fourth semester um, of my second year class. And what I've done with this semester is I've uh, developed a set of my own materials. Uh, and the idea behind this whole semester for me is that it's kind of a transition from the textbook to authentic materials. And of course, we still do use authentic materials in, in first year, but um, the bulk of their work is using a textbook. Um, and so kind of then going to mostly using authentic materials and longer things um, is the goal. And so I developed a set of uh, lessons that we do in the very beginning of that semester and then what they lead up to is that then after we finish that uh, kind of unit, um, we then go on to the rest of the semester being all based on authentic materials. It can be either uh, cartoons, we've used Chaburashka or uh, Vinny Puch, uh, or um, in recent years, I've been going more towards using sitcoms. And um, we mentioned on Monday that um, kind of the worse, the better as far as language goes in a way, because um, sitcoms are great in a variety of ways, because number one, they're uh, predictable. Um, they use physical humor. Um, and also they, they use stereotypes, which of course stereotypes are a bad thing in a lot of ways, but um, you know, uh, students need to know what are what are the stereotypes in Russian culture that you need to know about. And so we talk about those stereotypes when we use the sitcoms. And I can mention that the two sitcoms that I've used so far, my favorite one is Kakya Stal Ruskim, How I Became Russian. They love that one. Um, and it's, it's wonderful in all these ways because you learn uh, the main character is an American who comes to work in Russia. And so, of course, he makes all those faux pas that uh, students learn not to make, like giving um, a, an even number of flowers to someone, for example. Um, and so uh, they are encountering this character who is American, and then he's learning about Russian culture. Um, and so, of course, this is kind of full of, of these stereotypes, which are something they need to know. And so we talk about those things. Um, the other sitcom that I've used is uh, Sluga Naroda, um, which is also uh, an interesting one, The Servant of the People, the same one that um, President Zelensky uh, played in when he was an actor and comic. Um, and so this is especially appealing for students who are political science, uh, you know, people who are interested in politics. Um, but anyway, uh, to lead up to the sitcoms, I have a set of lessons where I'm focusing on transitioning them from sort of textbook to authentic materials. And so the lessons, um, one of them is kind of an introductory lesson. And then we have one that's on cognates, recognizing cognates, because 
I have noticed over the years that students are, are much worse at this than I thought they would be. Um, they don't recognize cognates very well, at least according to what I expected. And so I uh, kind of explicitly go through some of the things that um, make a word uh, if you're that if you know about it that make a word obviously a cognate so for example if it has an f in it it's probably a cognate and so there are some other things in there that sort of just attune them to looking for cognates and recognizing those uh, the next lesson is about word formation which i think is so so helpful for students because i remember as a student not realizing that for example you know, knizhka is the same thing as kniga. I didn't, I didn't understand that, and so I would be looking up things like knizhka uh, when I was learning Russian. And so, just getting students to the point where they recognize the relationships between words that have similar roots, and you know, why part of recognizing the part of speech of a word can be so useful, especially with reading. Um, and you know kind of getting them to the point where they recognize what they already know, you know, you know, the word Vsoki, but uh, you don't, maybe you don't need to then to look up Vsata, right? You can say, maybe those two words are related. And so we kind of explicitly go through some of that word formation. I also have a lesson on, it's called using a dictionary, but at this point I should probably change it to using I don't know, it's not only dictionaries, it's also translators. And at some point I probably need to add, I haven't done it yet, but I probably need to add a section about um, how to uh, productively use AI tools. Um, and so I have, uh, uh, up till then, I kind of discouraged them from using dictionaries and I asked them to focus more on the words that they get in the textbook. But at this point when they're kind of gonna be starting to uh, encounter more and longer authentic texts, they probably need to have practice with these tools. And as we know, it's not easy. To, it seems like it should be easy to use a dictionary, but it's not. They pick just the first thing that's that's written uh, if they get a definition when there are, you know, a hundred different possibilities. And so I try to, it doesn't, of course, they're not experts at it right away, but try to at least get them start thinking about what are some of the different strategies for using these tools like dictionaries and translators. And then I have specific lessons that are strategies for reading and strategies for listening. And so I kind of explicitly um, try to help them with strategies for dealing with authentic materials at that particular point in this is the fourth semester. Uh, sorry, she asks, have you been able to find it with subtitles? No, I don't, I use it without subtitles. So I have them watch it. They watch it several times and they do a bunch of activities that help them understand it. So I require that they watch it beforehand and then we do a bunch of activities on it, uh, sort of at, both out of class and in class. And then I require that they watch it again so that hopefully the last time that they watch it, they understand a lot more than they did the first time. So I'm actually glad it's not out there with subtitles because I want them to challenge themselves without it. Uh, certainly, um, you know, subtitles are a great tool for certain for certain things, but for this particular assignment, I want them to use it without subtitles. Shannon, I, I do the same thing with Kakya Um, And I usually actually um, direct my students to a particular part of the episode. I sometimes, um, just take clips and have them focus on certain aspects of language. Like I think there's a Novacelia in one and we look at um, specific language around uh, that event, but we watch it several times. And I also appreciate just like Stan and I kind of appreciate that there aren't subtitled versions of it yet. Definitely helpful if they're not able to just look to the English and, and they have to actually figure out what's being said. So definitely helpful to not have the subtitles just lit in this case. Really good. I'm going a little bit off script here, but we had a really good question come in from Olga I'm talking a little bit about scaffolding, segueing into maybe how, if you could speak a little bit about how maybe you have in the past helped to support students with learning exceptionalities or maybe need some accommodations to kind of level the playing field for all of our students. Uh, certainly for those of us who are K-12 educators, especially if we have a student who has an IEP 504 and needs that accommodation to be successful in our classes, 
it's something we have to be really mindful of in the K-12 field. And I was just wondering if either of you had any thoughts on things you might do to help students with exceptionalities. Um, yeah, uh, we actually had a student last year um, who was visually impaired and we had to very quickly um, kind of scramble to put alt text on all of our images and to um, transcribe our, um, not transcribe, um, but basically to put uh, alt text on all of our images and to um, transform our PDFs um, into documents that were readable um, with, uh, with our program. Um, and I, I support really anything that is going to work for the student. Um, so the suggestion to do, um, you know, uh, speech to text, I think is, is wonderful. Um, a wonderful option. Um, and one thing I've been trying to do, um, especially in regards like our, our new project and transforming our online materials into an OER. Um, I'm having to go back and review the thousands and thousands of images we have embedded into um, our Canvas courses and make sure one, that they're usable, that we can actually share them, but um, make sure that they are accessible and that they have really um, detailed alt text for um, anyone with low vision or uh, visual impairment. It can definitely be time consuming, but definitely a worthwhile project for sure. Uh, Shannon, any thoughts on things you've maybe done in the past or things that you do to make learning easier for students with exceptionalities? I feel like it's maybe not that different from what I was saying before about online tools, having the ability to um, offer so much support uh, without it being obtrusive. So I feel like that kind of inherently um, allows people with very different um, abilities to access materials. Just, I don't have a, a lot to add, but um, one thing that I've done in the past with um, online students, which I think can be useful for everyone, but maybe in particular for people who have challenges is uh, to build in as part of their assignment that they uh, have to um, kind of talk, uh, tell me at the end of the assignment what questions they have, not saying, not, not uh, phrasing it as, do you have questions, but saying, what is your question? Um, and, and kind of having that as a required part. I, I think a lot of us have the, the experience that when we teach face-to-face, -face, we get very used to that confused face that students give us. Um, you know, we get to know the students well enough that we can tell when a particular person uh, isn't quite uh, with us in a particular activity and being able to intercept that. And I think that's something that's a lot more difficult online uh, because it's just a lot harder to see those faces. And sometimes we're not allowed to require them to put on their cameras. Although I think I would advocate for cameras on if possible, but um, you know, in some instances we're supposed to not uh, require them to put on their cameras. And so that makes it a lot harder to identify those moments when anybody, but uh, you know, in particular students who have uh, maybe disabilities, for example, uh, need extra help. And so I think building in as part of your assignment that you have to say, what was the most difficult part of this assignment for you? Or what question do you still have about this? Or what, uh, there can be different ways of wording it, but I think that can be something um, worth considering. Absolutely. And just leaving that space open so students know that they can ask that question. And sometimes even the online experience, it's a little nicer to be able to privately send a question rather than being the sole person raising your hand in a face-to-face -face class to say, I don't understand. It can be a little intimidating, especially whenever that effective filters up and you want to kind of get in there and, and break that down. So really good idea. Something that I think would be really good to implement. Excellent. Um, jumping into a little bit about authentic materials, and I think this kind of ties in a little bit with scaffolding, but is we want to try to really push to use those authentic materials, but it can be really challenging. I personally teach primarily level one, and so it can definitely be challenging to use those authentic materials. 
uh, especially where students maybe don't have any background or knowledge. Um, so non-heritage speakers, they're just coming in, they've never seen Russian before and they're not sure what to do with it. How do you effectively use those authentic materials when students really don't have any background or connections to anything that you're putting in front of them? Uh, Shannon, we'll start with you, please. So one of the ways is to uh, choose them wisely. Um, you know, I think we are, we all understand that um, to to a certain extent, any text can be for any level as long as the task uh, goes along with the right level. But on the other hand, um, we don't also we also don't want to make our students feel completely intimidated. And so, you know, choosing our texts wisely can be helpful. So an example is one of the things that I'm always looking for is infographics for lower level students because they um they're so useful in that they incorporate visuals, they incorporate icons, they incorporate um, charts and and numbers, things that students can understand. And so uh I think, you know, that's one example of a type of text that can be very approachable uh, for students on lower levels. Um, I already mentioned the idea of kind of embedding scaffolding into things like um, videos or, or texts. Um, and then I just wanted to mention one other thing that I've done with my students on the lower levels, which is um, I created a set of scenarios um, and I may be stretching the definition of authentic materials a little bit here, but um, the scenarios, um, what I did with them was I um, took what students were learning in a particular unit, and then I imagined what could we do to put themselves, to have them put themselves in a real life situation with these things. So I'll give an example of that in the very, very uh, early parts of uh, first semester, um, I have my students do a scenario where they're pretending to work in a clothing store. So the, the things that they need to do to be able to do this scenario are they need to understand numbers up to a certain, I forget how many, but uh, up to a certain point. Uh, they need to understand words for clothing and they need to understand, um, I think it was colors. And then they had to have some uh, like politeness phrases like please and thank you, those kinds of things. And so I created a scenario where they were pretending to work in a clothing store. Um, the first thing that happens in the clothing store is that they receive boxes of clothes that they have to put in the right section of the store. And so it's pretty simple. It's just kind of a matching, right? But it, I'm hoping that it makes them imagine how they could use really use these skills, then they have to open the boxes and check how many, uh, you know, shirts they've received compared to, you know, how many they were supposed to receive. And of course, the order is not quite correct. And so then after they've done that on the next page, they have to write an email, quote unquote, to their manager of their store. And of course, at this point, they're really not, uh, a high enough level to write their own email. But what I do is I provide uh, an email and um, then they have to kind of drag and drop things into different places in the email. So they have to understand enough to say, you know, something like we got, we were supposed to get four pairs of pants and we only got three or something like that and, and put that into the email. And so it at least gives them the feeling of that they did something uh, using the target language. And it also sort of introduces them to the interface of uh, like an email, even though they're not writing it themselves yet. And so these scenarios, I'm using sort of semi-authentic materials, like materials that are based on authentic materials, and then trying to put it together into a scenario where I'm hoping that at least they feel that they can imagine themselves in that real life situation. I really love that. I love just, it's an everyday life thing that especially a student maybe studying abroad might want to seek employment and maybe something like a clothing store. This is truly an opportunity for them to practice and potentially make those connections. I absolutely love that. Thank you so much for that. Excellent. And then uh, Heather, same question. So how can teachers effectively use those authentic materials in the level one classroom, especially in situations where students don't have any background or connections with the language just yet? 
Um, so it's, especially at the lower levels, um, kind of like I was saying um, before, like I really like to stick with what's familiar to the students, you know, sticking with what's authentic, but what's going to be familiar to, to provide that sort of scaffolding and that comfort and familiarity. Um, so, I mean, this can be, you know, uh, YouTube videos um, in Russian and exploring the comment section um, if provided. A lot of people in the comment section will use emojis, you know, and this kind of provides a sort of scaffolding for students. They'll understand just by the visual what must be, you know, um, what the message might be. You know, they can use that as kind of a crutch as a, 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 um, for understanding, for decoding the language. Um, we go to shopping sites, like there's ozone.ru, which is kind of like an Amazon shopping site. And just by using, so the students can rely so much on the visuals to learn the language, um, to learn about um, pricing and uh, the currency values um, in, in Russian, um, you know, and they can go to, similar sites like in, in Russia and in the post-Soviet country. So it doesn't have to just be Russian sites, but Russian language sites like in Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan um, or Latvia, if if they exist, which they might not, um, or Georgia, et cetera. Um, transportation schedules online, um, airport information online. Uh, all of these these things are you know, sites we use on an everyday basis um, and that we're familiar with, but they just are in Russian. Um, so this is really where I like to start. And also at the beginning, especially for those students who are really brave and especially online, um, I encourage students to translate their lives, I say, into Russian, um, to change their settings on their phone or on Google. Uh, into Russian language so that everything that they see in Gmail or on their phone, all of their apps are in Russian, you know, if they just change the language. And so they can see right away these things that they're familiar with, these things that they already know translated into Russian. Um, and it it carries a lot of meaning, you know, when it's something that you already know. It's something that you use on a daily basis. It's something that you need. All of a sudden it's in Russian. Um, so the students can start engaging with these authentic materials in a way that's immediately meaningful for them. We use um, weather websites. I go to gizmateo.ru all of the time for students. And again, they see the visuals. Um, you know, they, <laughs> they understand the icon of, of the sun or, or the clouds and they, immediately know what this means, um, you know, but at the same time, they're going to learn things using these sites like, uh, you know, Celsius and Fahrenheit conversions and um, things like that that differ uh, between the, the cultures and that, that aren't just language specific. Um, so again, I like to stay with the familiar, but use authentic uh, sites and encourage that very, very, very early on. And that definitely, I think, especially for brand new students who might be intimidated, it might help lower that effective filter, just being able to see some things like the little sun icon or maybe an emoji of a smiley face. It just gives it a little bit of context and maybe just enough to try. So excellent ideas. Really good. Thank you. And then switching gears again, uh, talking a little bit just about, in general, uh, working with students, what do you find that students who are learning Russian struggle the most with whenever it comes to engaging in activities like reading and writing or related activities? And how do you overcome those challenges? Shannon, I would love to start with you on this one. Um, I think the less, the the lessons that I talked about before sort of highlight some of the things that they struggle with, uh, especially as I'm thinking about my second year students, like I said, the uh, the cognates are something that they're not as good at as what I think. Um, things like uh, they really struggle a lot with um, assuming that English word order should be the same as Russian word order. And so um, I, 
over and over again, I bring in the class headlines. Uh, I use headlines a lot, and I, I think that's um, also a good a good place to look for things because uh, to use with somewhat lower level students, maybe maybe not first year, but there could be some for first year, but for second year, for sure, because oftentimes the news is something that they're aware of what's going on. So they, they may have already some uh, knowledge of what's going on behind it. Um, but over and over, I'm trying to find headlines that have, for example, the direct object in the accusative case as the first word, because inevitably students just assume that whatever the first word is, is is the subject of the sentence and they make that mistake over and over again and so bringing in um, the authentic materials that have that and I think you know um, that's another point of where transitioning from uh, textbook language which probably uh, on purpose in a way uses uh, the more expected word order because that's what students are more likely going to understand you know, transitioning from that to the more authentic materials when um, those things are not the assumption, it's not going to be catering to to student um, student vulnerabilities. Um, it's, uh, so having those, you know, kind of bringing in over and over again examples of the of the things um, that they find challenging. Another one that I already mentioned is making connections between. Uh, words that are related to each other, um, you know, and I try to explain to them, you know, as a non-native speaker of Russian, but who's been working on learning Russian from a long time, for a long time, if I think about how I understand what I read, it's not that I always 100% know every word, but it's that oftentimes I can see a word that I've never seen before and sort of break it into parts. Uh, and then it, within the context to understand it. And so I try to, you know, in second year, there's, it's, it's too early for them to completely get it, but to at least start their awareness going about the fact that, um, you know, there's, they know a lot more than they think they do. There are words related to words that you know, and, um, you know, hopefully help them avoid some of the things that I was doing where I was looking up words that I should have been able to, um, to understand were related to words that I already know. That's really important too, and just kind of finding ways to build the confidence too. And maybe I don't understand 100% of everything, but there are tools and techniques that I can use to understand most of it. And we always know more than we think we know. So that's definitely an important thing to bring up too. Thank you. Heather, same question. What do you find students learning Russian struggle with the most, especially when it comes to engaging with reading and writing related activities? And how do you overcome those challenges? So my answer to this, um, the first thing that popped in my mind was um, the temptation to use translators. Um, and because that, that uh, in Canvas and, you know, Google, it, it on social media, um, you have this option right away. I have a lot of lessons where I have Russian text, you know, embedded into a Canvas page. And when I will open that page at the top, it will say translate into English. <laughs> and I think, well, this is terrible, <laughs> you know? Um, and so getting students not to do that is a massive struggle, I think. It's also, I also see the benefit, you know, in letting students see the translation and compare the Russian, you know, with the English. And um, as I've, as I've taught over the years, you know, I've told students at first, don't do that. You know, don't, don't translate the page, make sure you keep everything in Russian and, and don't look at the English, you know, don't be tempted. The more I teach, I think, well, you know, maybe we can use this as a tool. Uh, maybe we can figure out a way to use translators as a tool for helping students um, understand the Russian. So one part is, you know, just getting them to, to avoid it and just look at the Russian. Um, when I was a student, you know, when Shannon was a student, when most of us were students and I was learning Russian, um, and I had to look at a text. I only had a dictionary, you know, an actual like hard back, you know, paper dictionary. And I would use it all the time to look up words. And now students have access to translators 
and it will give them not just the words, but the entire, you know, grammar. And that's something I didn't have when, when I was learning Russian. So when a student is writing, especially, and they have this ability to, and, and they, I don't even think a lot of them realize what they're doing when they translate, when they, when they use an online translator to produce Russian, you know, from, from the English they give, I don't think that they realize they're not just translating words, they're translating entire um, grammatical structures. So this conversation with students, how to use a translator effectively as a tool for learning Russian, I think is especially challenging. And it's something that happens, especially at the beginning, um, communicating how this how these tools can be used as tools for learning and not, you know, just a, a tool for submitting like correct Russian. I think that's incredibly challenging. Um, so that's, that, that was my like initial response was just dealing with, with the technology that's so readily available. You know, why wouldn't students use it if they can having that conversation? Absolutely. And I'm finding, especially over the last few years, now that we have so many AI tools and new AI tools and AI tools keep getting better and better. And it's just so important, as you said, to have that conversation about, okay, we're acknowledging that this technology exists. And, and yes, likewise, I, I had my book, I had my little dictionary that I brought with me back and forth to class. And, and that's not a thing they do now. The students do not have that same dictionary, which is probably better for their backs if they're not carrying it around all day. But nonetheless, it's acknowledging things have changed. And so I'm finding that it's really, really important to really get out right in front of it. And as part of my onboarding, I am Re planning to revisit it even just going into this new semester, but I've really decided to dedicate more time talking about what is an appropriate use of translators and AI versus what is not really setting those boundaries, setting them firmly and right out of the gate. Is that kind of what you do too, Heather? What are those types of conversations or what does that content look like for you? Yeah. Um, and it's some, it's, it's actually a conversation I have several times, um, over uh, the course of a semester, you know, I tell them up front, look, you know, you have this, I know you have this, um, right now, you know, especially at the very beginning, I want you not to use it. Everything that you need as is, is here provided for you. Um, if you do engage with it, ask yourself, like if, when it, when it gives you content, when it gives you something, are you able to explain every single element of what you see? If you're not able to, then you have no business using it. Um, and, you know, I, I tell them things as, as their teacher, like, look, I know exactly what you can produce. I know what you can't produce. I'll know when you use a translator and I know when you're, when it's your language and when it's not. Um, and if you want to test me, you know, test me and, and, and you'll see, I tell them that if you use a translator, you know, the very uh, first thing that, that you're risking is a very uncomfortable conversation with me. And worst case scenario is this, this is escalated to like a Dean of students issue. So I try to put that like at the beginning, like don't, don't engage with them to do your work. Um, it's, it's actually challenging to say, fine, you know, look up a word. If you're reading something, and if you don't know it, look it up. That's fine. That's what I always did. You know, if you don't understand a string of words, have it translated, that's fine. But going the other way, when you're trying to convey something in Russian, if you use a translator and you don't know exactly, if you can't explain exactly what it's producing, you don't need to use it. Um, That's what it looks like. And for the most part, I'd say like 85% of students just eschew them altogether and just try to use the content that's um, included in our course material and uh, create within those parameters. Um, and then others uh, look outside and I have to have conversations kind of offline individually with students. Um, and it's it's really, 
a learning process. Like how, I don't think that, I don't think students are being, you know, malicious or that they're, they're trying to get an easy A. I think that a big issue with a lot of our students is they truly don't know. This is the first time they're learning a foreign language. They don't understand that Russian isn't just English translated word for word into Russian, you know, and they don't know how to use these tools. So sometimes it takes like having offline individual conversations about using these tools effectively. Um, it's really just student by student scenarios, I guess. Absolutely. And there is a lot of just getting to know our students as individuals and maybe potentially offering the help that they need so that they're not misusing tools and things like that. So there's a lot of things to think about. Shannon, anything to add to that, talking a little bit about maybe even during the online, the, the onboarding process, how do you help students understand what is and isn't an appropriate use of some of these technologies? Yeah, one specific thing I want to share is that I always show them this video. It's kind of an old video, but it's still funny. Um, it's called something like Translating with Babblefish. Um, and it has a, a girl who uh, takes a Japanese, I think it's a Japanese recipe, and then she uses an online translator to translate it into English, and it comes out with these really crazy uh, sounding translations into English and then her her recipe like catches on fire and everything uh, and so I think it's a lighthearted way to at least start the conversation so that it's not all like completely serious like oh you're going to get in trouble or something like that but just to have a kind of funny way to start talking about it and like I said before I do discourage them from using translators for the first part of their learning and then I do have a specific lesson where we talk about you know how productively to use them um, you know use uh, like Yandex Translate or Viki Slovar and show them like don't pick just pick the thing that comes up in the in the box like there's a lot of uh, things that appear below that give you a lot more information and then helping them realize, oh, I do know how to identify a noun versus a verb. And so if I need a verb in a particular sentence, then I need to make sure that what I'm choosing is at least a verb. Um, and, you know, then there's some other tools uh, that that give a lot of examples and, and kind of explaining them to them how to use that. I don't think there's any silver bullet to getting out of this um, with with online translators. Um, but, you know, hopefully, at least um, for me, and when I'm teaching second year Russian, most of my students do actually want to learn Russian. And so it's and like Heather said, I don't think it's a situation where they're maliciously doing this, it may be just they ran out of time, you know, to finish their homework or something like that. And so I think in most situations, our students really do want to learn Russian. And so if, if um, we give them these tools, hopefully they will uh, learn to use them. And, and like you said, a lot of them feel or think that it's just a one-to-one -one word translation. And that, you know, that's something that, um, it, over time they understand that's not the case. Um, and that, uh, using translators in that way can just hurt them in some instances rather than help them. Absolutely. And just having those conversations and setting the groundwork early, I think, at least for me personally, I think I've avoided a lot of uncomfortable situations that way. Thank you for that. Uh, we had a question come in from Corey. I thought that was a good one. Uh, talking about how she's finding that sometimes students will look up grammar explanations online rather than using those materials that we, in some cases, create ourselves or at least curate for them. And thoughts on maybe how to help with this. And she probably has the same worry I have. I worry about sometimes the students aren't internalizing things because they can so easily and quickly look things up online. So anyone have any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one thing I do is I do require them to watch my explanations. And I know that there are some people who um, don't support that approach, but I do, um, they have to do my activities, the ones I've given them. Um, I've also, uh, shown them and I, I plan to continue showing them, um, some examples of 
For example, when AI just hallucinated Russian grammar, you know, when I asked chat GPT, you know, um, I, I forget what I asked it, but it, I asked, I I, it was something about genitive plural. I said, can you explain the genitive plural endings in Russian? And it gave me like knigov and stuff like that. So I, I show that to my students and, and since they already know that, um, I can say, hey, see, <laughs> you know, you can't rely on, on this. So be very careful. So Um, you know, that is one tool. I'm I'm guessing that ChatGPT has gotten better with that since then, but I still am going to show them the old version because I don't trust it in any case for, for at least that type of thing for those kind of factual questions. A hundred percent. It is so important to vet any AI produced content and you can get some really interesting results from AI, definitely. Um, Heather, any thoughts on how we can discourage students from maybe always just relying on some outside materials rather than using the content we've created? In your case, especially, you've created a lot of content. I mean, I just try to tell them, you know, at the beginning, like uh, that we have this wealth of, of content built in. Um, you're really just costing yourself more time by going outside and that you're responsible for the content here that's delivered here, and you're going to be tested on what's here. So you, you don't need to look outside. If you do have questions, if you found something, by all means, you know, bring it to me. I'm, I'm happy to look at it and uh, vet it, um, but there's no need, at least at the beginning, you know, there's, there's really no need um, to go outside. And I try to make it fun and engaging and, um, interactive so that they're not tempted to do that. Absolutely. And by keeping it fun, engaging, interactive, they're going to be a lot less likely to use some random thing they might have to look up online that may or may not make sense. So very yeah. good points. I had a question come in from Natalia. Um, this maybe might be a little bit more for Shannon, but I'm um, talking about working with the Middlebury Language Immersion Program where both of the students and the instructors are making that commitment to stay in the target language. But whenever you teach kind of more of a regular semester, um, do you have any idea about how much of a percentage that you stay in the target language? Um, and what times do you resort to maybe using English in the online classroom? Yeah, um... I'm okay with using some English in my class, honestly. Um, you know, to try to, there are certain instances in which it's much more efficient. And also I, I do want my students, if we're talking about, so for example, in the, when we're using the sitcom and we're talking about stereotypes, their level of Russian is not really good enough to be able to talk about stereotypes. Um, in the target language. And so I'm okay with uh, t uh, doing some of that in English. And uh, honestly, even at the um, the School of Russian in Middlebury, everyone takes a language pledge, but there are certain uh, lower level classes where within the classroom, you are allowed to use some English. So um, I'm okay with using some English when I feel that uh, it benefits students more than it would to to try to force uh, the use of the target language. I know not everyone agrees with me on that, but uh, we can agree to disagree, can't we? Absolutely. And I mean, as I am a K through 12 teacher, one of the things that curriculum has implemented, and I will honestly die on this hill, even though I'm a language teacher, is that we are told to give brief instructions in English that are very to the point and succinct so that students, especially students with exceptionalities or maybe are struggling, can understand what is the task that I have been assigned to do. So by having that for students and making sure that we're reaching them, whatever that might look like, it's ideal to try to stay in the target language, but there are times absolutely when we want to use well, English. Well, and I want to sure. say that when I when I was taking Russian in college and I was suddenly in third year Russian and my textbook and my whole class was suddenly in Russian with no English, I almost quit taking Russian because I couldn't understand what I was supposed to do. And I don't want that you know, not understanding a task, for example, to make someone feel like maybe they don't need to take Russian anymore. So I don't know, my my own personal experience from that point of view maybe uh, influences me in the, to, to that extent. 
That's very understandable. And one of the things that we have to be mindful of too is that we want to retain the students. We want them going into those upper levels and, and climbing that ladder of proficiency. So making sure that they're comfortable and that they feel empowered enough to complete their tasks. Really important stuff. Absolutely. Heather, anything you wanted to add to that in terms of um, how much time you spend in the target language, especially in the online classroom? And when do you often find yourself using English? Um, I think this is a good question. And I probably, I mean, I probably use English too much. Um, and I, for me, I think it really depends on the task and whatever the communicative goal is for a particular lesson. Um, you know, if, you know, the goal is to be able to talk about your hobbies and to be able to talk about uh, where you live or who's in your family or whatever, you know, then yes, you stay in Russian all of the time. I model and I get them to repeat. Um, but if it's a question of, you know, talking about the language, talking about a task or what you have to do or about the grammar, I mean, do they really need to know how to talk about the grammar in Russian? I don't think so. I don't think that's useful language. It's hard enough to understand these concepts in English. So for those particular topics, I usually will, especially in the first and second year, I will switch to English just to make it as easy as possible, you know, to get over this hill of like, what are we looking at? You know, what are the concepts we're covering? What is the task at hand? And then getting into the actual language, like, what are you going to, you know, to convey a particular, you know, thought or feeling, of course, all in Russian. But when we're talking about it, um, I have no problem going into English. And um, cultural topics, you know, when it, like um, if we're if we're stepping back and examining, you know, comparing um, practices and you know and, and the cultures, then again, it depends on the task. You know, if if our task, if our particular communicative goal has to do with you know comparing, then it should be in Russian. But if it's you know examining something, you know, new, a new concept um, where we haven't uh, practiced a particular, you know, language form um, and we just want to, you know, make a comment about comparisons um, across the cultures. I have no problem with that being in English either. And again, this is especially at the lower level. Um, I don't insist that that everything be um, all in Russian from the beginning because I mean, that is scary. And there are, we, we are dealing with such a limited amount of time. I think that, you know, to, to the decision to stay completely in Russian, especially at the lower level, would cost a lot of time when, you know, we could take a couple of, of seconds just to say something in English to get a, a, a point across when it's, you know, Accusative case is the direct object case. What's a direct object? A direct object is that, you know, the thing, the thing that like receives the action of the verb or whatever. And, you know, um, talking about that in Russian, and that's, to me, that's a waste of time when it's, it's such a difficult concept for English speakers. You know, we don't, we don't really deal with case. Absolutely. And one of the things that I find challenging, too, is that in the language that I teach, there are some cognates, but there aren't a plethora of cognates. And so that can in itself can make things really challenging. And especially if you're explaining concepts to lower level students, those novice students that are brand new, especially if it's a topic, say, for example, culture, where they really need to have a deeper understanding and appreciation of a cultural difference or maybe something that's very common. Having those conversations in English, I definitely see where there can be a lot of value add with that versus kind of pushing and trying to stay completely in the target language. When, and as you said, Heather, we have so little time with them. So definitely making sure we're using our time well. Fantastic points all around. And I'm just appreciating everybody who's leaving comments and questions in the chat. Uh, we did have one uh, question that came in from one of my colleagues, Katja Decker at NCBPS. And uh, folks in the chat, if you know as well, please chime in. I want to see if we can help Katja out with this. But she's saying a local school system contacted her to offer a beginner online Russian course for their teachers who are currently working on teaching certificates to become teachers of various subjects. This request is due to a very large number of Russian speaking students arriving in the area. 
And this has to be an online asynchronous Russian course, saying about eight weeks that combines the Russian language with methods of working with Slavic students. This will help future teachers in their classes, such as science, math, English, literature, et cetera. The course will be offered through the local university. She says she has a few ideas that need to be developed, but wanted to ask if anybody has experience with such a situation, any suggestions they might want to use. Um, panelists, absolutely. But uh, if anybody as well in the audience has any suggestions, we are definitely open to hearing them. This may depend on the level, but the um, lessons that I mentioned on Monday for heritage students um, might be useful to someone in the, who's teaching something like this. And these are through the uh, Middlebury School of Russian. Uh, it's the heritage site. There are lessons that are specifically designed to help heritage students with um, the, their particular challenges. So that could be, those could be some materials. They're free and open for anyone to use. So those could be some materials that could be useful. That definitely sounds helpful. And OERs are fantastic um, and, and the OER related content as well. Um, so hopefully that would help. Heather, any ideas on that one? Um, can you like explain again, like exactly what I missed the very first. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, this sounds like um, it's a request um, to offer a beginner online Russian course. Um, it sounds like it's going to be done for the university, but it sounds like um, this is to um, help those working on teaching certificates to become teachers of various subjects. Um, and that's because there are a lot of Russian speaking students that are arriving in uh, Katya's local area. Um, so the teachers. idea of... And also course some help with, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yes. It's it's course for teachers who have the students who arrived recently, but they don't have good English yet, but they have to take physics, science, English literature. So it would help teachers to know some basics of Russian. This is what school district. So they want them to have some basics and how to work with the students. Ah. So they want them to learn some basics of Russian and methods of working with them. Wow, that's great. Um, hmm. I haven't heard about anything specifically for that. And actually, probably the ones I mentioned aren't, I misunderstood what we were talking about there. So probably the things I mentioned were, would not fit for that situation. I don't know of anything in particular for this. Certainly... Um, there are lots of um, materials that are for beginning learners, like the Miege um textbook that I mentioned earlier, or the LLC Commons has a lot of um, uh, things that people can use to learn Russian, but it's not specifically focused on this kind of situation. I'm yeah, that's really, that's really interesting. Um, I was also like, Shan, I was going to say, well, you know, we have our online courses, which are open to everybody through our extension campus, but they're intensive and that wouldn't at all like uh, meet the needs, I think, of these teachers. Um, I mean, there are all kinds of YouTube videos that are, you know, freely available um, on like just basic, uh, basic Russian um tutorials. Olga and Corey are mentioning a book that I also use a lot, which is called English Grammar for Students of Russian. And oh. um, that one, um, I use it for my students, especially if they, uh, for example, have don't understand grammar terms, uh, like, you know, verb, <laughs> noun, that kind of thing. Um, and it's a short book, and it's pretty quick to read. And so that could be um, something that could be considered. Thank you for reminding us about that one. Olga and Corey. Yeah, that's one I use too. Yeah, I was going to also suggest YouTube videos because there's so many different ones on so many different topics. Um, but I'm just seeing all the love coming in from the chat and thank you to everybody who suggested things. And I really appreciate that. So we want to definitely make sure that we get a resource for Katya. Um, and Ellen, actually, I see that you just put in a, a something about the NCVPS webinars. Um, we do offer a lot of webinars out there, but Ellen, is there anything particular? Please feel free to uh, put on the mic and share what you think. Yeah, I was just sitting there thinking about one of the things that we here in North Carolina have done for our teachers, especially since the, the, the pandemic and 
creating webinars and, and actually looking at very course specific webinars to offer teachers in North Carolina. And of course, they're open to anybody to come, not just North Carolina. And I'm just wondering, Katja, thinking about, you know, if our own Russian teachers could potentially do some webinars that are specifically targeted to invite those core subject area teachers to come and have some lessons uh, of what you're talking about that, you know, maybe that's something that we can offer and, and get on the website so we can actually customize it as to what you're thinking about. And of course, that would benefit anybody here in the group. Again, it's not just North Carolina. No, thank you for that. I love the idea. And yes, there's a lot of resources that NCDPS puts out and everybody is always welcome to come out to those and, and come out and for those webinars. Well, thank you all very much for that. Um, just scanning the chat again. Thank you all so much to everybody who suggested things. Thank you to our panelists for making those suggestions and for really a fantastic uh, past two hours of really good conversation. And it's truly my hope that after everybody's had these discussions and kind of processed this, this will give you all some new ideas for things to implement in the new year and a lot of good things that you can use for your own students. We have the link to our survey uh, in the chat that Jim very kindly posted for us. And Alan also posted the link to our digital transition series at NCVPS. Those are free webinars for any educator. Um, I actually do facilitate those as well. So please feel free to stop by if you see any topics that you like. Um, and again, we've got lots of great content coming up for you tomorrow, not tomorrow, uh, in, so 46 hours from now. I know everybody's on different time zones. 46 hours from now, we will have our final uh, conversation and that's dealing a little bit more um, on different topics, but we do hope you'll be able to make it out for that. And thank you all very much for being part of this. Uh, thank you again to our panelists for taking the time. And we look forward to another great round of conversations in 46 hours. Thank you all very much for being here.